Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Haddonfield United Methodist Church. We are happy that you're here. I see some smiling faces in the audience. Uh, if you're at home drinking coffee in your PJs, I'm a little jealous, but we are glad that you're here also. So let's stand together and sing our opening song, River of Life. This was new last week, so let me hear you sing it. One, two, ready. Have you and I have to say it's amazing to see you in these chairs because it shows miraculous transformation just last night we had over 230 people in this space um, some of you may be wondering what are they clapping for we had uh, a pasta dinner last night one night in Italy to support and raise money for our student ministries for our youth group to go on a mission trip this coming uh, summer and without, don without tallying the extra donations and the sale of food, just the tickets and the basket sales so far, we've raised $10,744 for youth. So, so and I, I was doing, I have, a, I have a young person in my family going on the trip, so I went home and I was doing the math. So if there are 10 kids, that's okay, that, that cuts the trip in half or, you know, um, but I want to say thank you so much. If anyone volunteered, thank you. If you were in the talent show, thank you. Uh, if you came and purchased something or just ate, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, another event coming up next week, our New Jersey Master Chorale Concert, which is also an incredible event that happens twice a year here. It's our community choir, and they will be singing with members of the Philadelphia Orchestra and Friends. Their program is entitled Reconciliation. And boy, don't we need some reconciliation in our world today. And uh, the program will be next Saturday or next Sunday at 7 o'clock. 
you need a ticket, but they are free. So on page eight of the bulletin, you can find information of how to get your ticket online. For friends online, we're grateful for you. You can go to haddonfieldumc.org slash now, and you can get tickets for that. This Thursday, back in our cafe, we're going to have the National Day of Prayer Breakfast. That is an event that we host each year, and it is with the Haddonfield Council of Churches. All the churches in town, we come together to have this event. This year, we will have a, a speaker named Pilar hogan Kloski, and she is the Executive Director of St. Joseph's Carpenter Society. She'll be talking about housing and homelessness in Camden County. So, Tickets, you can find out how to get tickets on page 8, or you can call the church office. Um, today, in worship, I'm going to be wrapping up our sermon series, Our Common Home. And next week, we are going to begin a brand new sermon series as we start May. And it's all about the book of Acts, the early Christian church. And uh, here's a little glimpse of what we're going to be preaching on. What if the church was never meant to refer to a building? What if church wasn't about meeting on a Sunday morning? What if the church wasn't seen as a nonprofit organization? The fact is, before Christianity was a religion, before churches were buildings, before Jesus was a known figure, the church was a community of people sharing life together, meeting human needs, giving and receiving forgiveness, following the teachings of Jesus and sharing his good news wherever they went. Join us this May as A Church is Born, the story of the early Christian church according to Acts. Let's give a round of applause for uh, Aiden Murray, I know, and the rest of the tech team. They do such a good job. Doesn't look so professional and like nice. I really like that. So, And aren't we so blessed to have... Aiden and all of our tech team. Um, if you are wanting to get more involved, just let us know because there's all kinds of different jobs that you could um, do to help us. So <laughs> uh, let's stand together and continue in our worship service. We're going to sing I'm So Blessed. One, two, ready. <laughs>
similar, um, but it's just talking about how much gratitude that we have for, um, for knowing God and having God in our lives. So this is called gratitude. fall short I've got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude sing with us I could sing these songs as I often do but every song must end and you so good to see you and worship with you on this beautiful Sunday morning that the Lord has made. And at this moment, we want to create a sacred space with God in our prayer. The prayer is not a transactional act, but an act of faith. 
bringing us back to God's loving presence, to center ourselves and grounded in God's unconditional love. What do you bring today uh, in your heart? Wherever you may be on your life journey, I know you bring something and you have something to be grateful. So let us create a sacred space at this moment. And I invite you to take a deep breath. Feel the rhythm of your body that God is breathing in you. And I invite you to close your eyes as well. Go to God in prayer. Lift up your heart. Please join your heart with mine in prayer. O oh, loving and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of life and the gift of this day as we gather in this space to worship and praise your name. Thank you for the gift of community and the gift of the natural world where we find you and a sense of belonging with each other. We come to you as, you, as we are because you made us. You give us every breath we take in our lung, and you know our heart before we say a word. Even when we feel like we are alone, we know you never abandon us. You see our contrite heart. Oh Lord, we long for you. We search for you to know you better and more in our everyday life. Open our eyes to see your work in your creation and in our everyday life. Open our ears to hear the voice of your teaching, the way of life. Open our hearts to deepen our love for you and our neighbors each and every day. Oh God, we bring our weakness and sickness and brokenness. We let go of our disappointment and frustration. We lift up our hopes and dreams before you, O oh Lord. Draw us closer to you and show your mercy on us. And at this moment, we want to pray for each other. We lift up our heavy hearts before you, all our worries and concerns, fears and pain and sorrow. For those who need wisdom, provide your wisdom enough. For those who long for the answers in their lives, provide your guidance in their every step. For those who feel lost, please hold their hands and plant a new seed of your hope. For those who are sick and suffer, please bring your healing and wholeness to their body, mind, and spirit. Oh God, we pray for those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. Please let their hearts be filled with your peace and comfort at the moment they need you the most. O oh Lord, hear our prayers and have mercy on us. And we thank you for the gift of connection as the United Methodist Church. And we pray for the general conference happening in Charlotte. Bless this sacred gathering. Lead us into the way of your love and compassion as one body. O oh Lord, plant your hope in and among us in one body and one spirit. We give our life as an offering to you. Help us build up a loving and welcoming community together. Let all we do in our ministries only point to you, your glory, for others also see your goodness and faithfulness on our discipleship journey. Oh God, we also pray for peace in our hearts, in our community, in our nation, and in the world. Oh Lord, let it begin with us. Remember your people who are suffering from violence in Ukraine, Palestine, and Israel. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. We pray all these, our spoken and unspoken prayers of heart. In the name of Jesus, our Christ. And continue to pray together with the word that Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, a few weeks ago, we brought in new members uh, to our church, and today we're going to welcome in four, new, four more new members in the life of our congregation, two in this service and then two in our 1030 service. And so I want to invite uh, Kathy and John Claudius to come and stand next to me, and um, we are going to welcome them into the life of our church. And uh, I invite our lay leader, Mary Louise, to come forward. And so, Kathy and John, I'm just going to ask you uh, to reaffirm your baptismal vows that would have be, been declared in your baptism. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power that God gives you uh, to resist evil, injustice, and oppression? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? If so, say, I do. I do. And will you, as members of the Church Universal, remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in this world? If so, say, I will. I will. And as members of Haddonfield United Methodist Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, say, I will. I will. And then one more vow. And before we go to this vow, I want to say that Kathy and John are, are doing two things. They're joining our church and then they're moving away. <laughs> and the reason I mention this is because the church post-COVID is a very different church than the church pre-COVID. We actually have a number of members worshiping with us right now from Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Illinois, Germany, South Korea, every week, and Florida. I know I have family worshiping with us right now. I know uh, a lot of us do. And so Kathy and John plan to be active members of a small group of classes and worship with us. And so we're grateful that you're calling us home and that we'll travel with you to the Poconos, correct? So, in that spirit, will you faithfully participate in our ministries by your prayers, your virtual presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. I will. Now, friends, uh, there are formal written vows, but I'm going to simply say, when someone joins our church, we as a congregation are asked if we will do the same things. If we confess Jesus as our Savior, if we rely on Christ for our strength, and most of all, will we walk alongside our new members in a spirit and a community of love, forgiveness, and grace? And if you will do that, say amen. amen. I welcome you both, and we are privileged to have you, and we will be privileged to have you virtually when you finally move, and so thank you. Let's welcome them into our community. Good morning. The word of God for us today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 40, and the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 12 and 13. Matthew. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all of the angels with him, then he will be on the throne of his glory. All the nations will gather before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
For when I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Isaiah 55. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the beginning, when God created all things, God called the natural world good. The sun, moon, stars, water, plants, creepy crawly things, fish, animals. It is good. Then God created humans to till and keep the earth so life could be abundant and God would be revealed to all people through the oceans, mountains, trees, sunrise, and flowers. Today our planet is in need of care. Just as Jesus called us to love our neighbors as ourselves, we must do so through ensuring all people have places to live, food to eat, water to drink, and a place where we can live together in peace and harmony. Join us in April as we see God's glory revealed to us in our common home. Friends, if you would turn to page six in your bulletin, you'll find sermon notes that we've prepared for you to follow along in the message and some questions to uh, fill in. For folks online, uh, go to haddonfieldumc.org slash now, and you can download our sermon notes as well. Um, so where is your favorite place to experience nature? Like, what's your favorite setting? Just call it out. Beach. Woods. Backyard. Pinelands? Yeah, Pinelands. Mountains. My favorite is anywhere there's a stream surrounded by trees. And I think lots of times our, our favorite place kind of reveals how we grew up or where we grew up. Uh, for me, mountains, trees, water, that's, that's really the most pristine and beautiful setting. It brings a, a sense of peace of mind. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever gone into nature or gone to experience uh, outside and were confronted with negative signs of human activity? How might you experience that? Trash pollution, right? Have you ever gone to a lake or a stream or even the beach and seen like oil floating or scum floating on the water? I, when I was in high school, a few friends and I got into trout fishing. And in the state of Pennsylvania, trout fishing is a really big deal. The second Saturday, I believe, of March is opening day. It's like the Super Bowl. People, they really plan and put a lot into opening day. Opening day is big because the state stocks waterways. So you have the best chance of catching, catching fish on opening day. So my friends and I in high school and college would camp the night before. Of course, we would stay up very late and then we would wake up very early and be tired and fish all day. And it was a blast. Uh, 
we often would, the week before, go to different places and try to figure out where we were going to fish on the first day. You're not allowed to fish before opening day because streams are stocked. And so the best way to find it is to take bread and drop it in the water, right? So often people would share, oh, I heard if you go up behind this place and around that bend, there's, there's still water in the stream. That's where you want to go. And I remember going a few places and we would drop bread in and then immediately you would see trout come out of the water. And that's where you want to be. One year, my friends and I camped out and we were excited about our fishing hole. It wasn't far from my house. There was a waterfall at the top so you could stand above the hole, or you could go down below on the bank. You had a lot of options. And that morning, about 6 a.m., we show up. The sun is coming up, and we are greeted by about 50 other <laughs> fishermen. I remember that experience because I literally was elbow to elbow. We, like, formed a circle. And the more experienced fishermen were in waders, so they had, a dis they had an advantage, and they were in the middle of the, of the hole. And I remember several fish I would catch as I pulled them up. The, another person would snag my line, so the two lines would go like this, and then the fish, raised out of the water, decided he didn't want to be there. So he jumped off the hook, right, in front of my face. And that happened basically all morning. And I thought, this isn't fun, right? And then when the day was over, what do you think was left behind in this beautiful, wonderful, pristine space? Trash. People just trashed it. They left beer cans. They, they left bait containers. They, they left fish parts. They, anything, they just left. And this beautiful, pristine, wonderful thing was trashed. Well, we are living in a day and an age in which we are seeing and experiencing kind of human degradation of the environment that is far more serious than, than a simple fishing experience. And so we've been talking about care for our common home because how we live in God's gift of nature is not just some civic thing, but it is a spiritual thing. And I, it, this, this sermon series was inspired by a letter called Laudato Si, written by Pope Francis in 2016. It was, it's called an encyclical, which in the Catholic tradition is a teaching letter. The Pope would write letters that are very involved and deep, and they can be used as teaching documents. Well, Pope Francis wrote this letter, Laudato Si, about the care for our common home, and it was not written just to the Roman Catholic Church. It was written to every human living on earth. And it was ultimately used in many ways by the United Nations in setting their, um, their uh, centennial goals. I want to share a little bit from uh, Pope Francis's letter. First of all, he centers it in the spirituality of his namesake, St. Francis of Assisi. You've heard of him before, right? He, Pope Francis says of St. Francis, he loved and was deeply loved for his joy, for his generous self-giving, his open-heartedness. He was a mystic and a pilgrim who lived in simplicity and in wonderful harmony with God, with others and with nature and himself. He shows us just how inseparable the bond is between concern for nature justice for the poor, commitment to society, and interior peace. This is not a modern thing. This dates back almost a thousand years that Francis shows us that there's a relationship between the care for nature, poor society, and our own inner peace. We are only at peace if our neighbor is at peace. Francis shows us that. Now he says, what more, St. Francis, uh, faithful to Scripture, invites us to see nature is a magnificent book in which God speaks to us and grants us a glimpse of his infinite beauty and goodness. If you are stressed out, go take a walk by the shore, right? If you are distressed, go in the woods and spend some time. Nature speaks to us. And that might sound political, or that might sound leftist, or it might sound something, but what I want to say, it is biblical, and it is spiritual. So 
Pope Francis begins to cite his predecessors, different popes uh, throughout history. And he says in 1971, Pope Paul VI referred to the ecological concern as a tragic consequence of unchecked human activity due to an ill-considered exploitation of nature. Humanity runs the risk of destroying it and becoming, in turn, a victim of this degradation. 1971, before some of us were alive, Pope Paul VI says that humans run the risk of destroying the environment and then becoming victims of their own destruction. And then... In the 1980s, Pope John Paul II became increasingly concerned about this issue, and in his first encyclical, he warned that human beings frequently seem to see no other meaning in their natural environment than what serves for immediate use and consumption. And we've seen that, right? So what if we pollute water to get coal? Because the greater end is economic sustainability or economic gain. So what if we pollute the air to create products for us to buy? So what if we, if we remove mountaintops in places like West Virginia? We're never going to go there anyway, right? It feeds our need for electricity. So what? These resources are for our consumption. Pope John Paul said, be careful. It will come back to bite you. And so then Pope Francis says, the urgent challenge to protect our common home includes a concern to bring the whole human family together to seek a sustainable and integral development for we know that things can change. The creator does not abandon us. He never forsakes his loving plan or repents of having created us. And here's the key. Humanity still has the ability to work together in building our common home. We still have the ability. It's not too late. I encourage you to check out the letter. In the sermon notes, there's a QR code in HaddonfieldUMC.org slash now. We have a link to it. Pope Francis goes on to talk specifically about a few issues. Pollution and climate change, the issue of water, loss of biodiversity, decline in the quality of human life, global inequality, weak responses to this crisis, and a variety of differing opinions that paralyzes us. The bottom line is that Pope Francis in this letter encourages us to a global commitment to care for our common home, which in turn embraces the call of Jesus to love God and love our neighbor as ourself. Now, you may think, or you, it may be in your mind, well, this sounds an awful lot like politics. This is some sort of an agenda. Why doesn't that pope mind his own business? Why don't religious leaders stay in their lane? I believe that Jesus critics said the same thing when he said what he said in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is telling his disciples about how the prophet Zechariah and the prophet Daniel will be fulfilled. Both of those prophecies say that God is going to come and restore the kingdom of Israel and going to restore right relationship, the people of Jacob and God, and it's going to happen through a human. The term son of man, Ben Haish, literally means a human. God will come back in the form of a human human and restore community. And Zechariah says it will take place on the Mount of Olives. Where is Jesus in Matthew 25? The Mount of Olives at the Last Supper. And so Jesus is saying when it is fulfilled, the Son of Man will come and will begin to build his own kingdom by welcoming some people in to be a part of it. And in turn, he will cast some out who will not be a part of that kingdom. He will divide them like sheep and goats, and this is the criteria in which he will invite those in. Those that are going to be a part of restoring the relationship between God and the people will be those who care for the least of these. That is a political statement because 
in Jesus' day, people who were poor deserved to be poor. People who were infirmed deserved to be infirmed. People who were born with a disability must have done something wrong. Or their parents did something wrong. So if you were caring for them and ministering to them, you were meddling with the divine universe. And so you are working a political agenda. Jesus mentions these things. He says, when he names the acts of care to the least of these, he's referring to spiritual issues that are impacted by greater political issues. Look, he, he talks about hunger and thirst. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. That points to the breakdown of food sustainability. If there was not a food sustainability crisis, there would be no one who is hungry or thirsty. Jesus talks about hospitality to the strangers. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. Jesus is talking about immigration. He talks about visiting the sick. I was sick and you visited me. This is the, the limited access of health care of people. Only certain people could be made well and had access to doctors. When Jesus says, I was imprisoned and you visited me, he is messing in the penal justice system. And pointing to the fact that many people who were in prison shouldn't be in prison because they were simple debtors or they disagreed with Rome or they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus is pointing to these issues that are not political issues that the church spiritualizes. But Jesus calls us to see that these are spiritual issues that get politicized. Food sustainability is not a political issue. It's a human issue. It's a spiritual issue. God cares about our physical needs. And it is us in the world and in society that draw all kinds of weird lines and odd bedfellows that politicize solutions. But the bottom line is when people suffer, God is concerned. And when people hurt, the children of God should care. Amen? Amen? And so Jesus is showing those, his disciples, that when the Son of Man comes and restores relationship, it is those who have a space in their heart to care who will get it and who will be able to rebuild the kingdom of God. I grew up hearing this verse, usually at Christmas time, because there's a Johnny Cash song in which Johnny Cash reads it. Does anyone know that? Go, go Google it. I remember hearing it all the time. Johnny Cash reading Matthew 25 at Christmas time. And I used to think, well, how many times do you have to do these things to come into the kingdom of God? Because I went on, I, I helped it in a soup kitchen in 1994. I'm good, right? Check. I had an uncle who was in the hospital once, and I visited him. Check. Right? I welcomed someone from the church into my house recently. Check. Right? And here's the real question. Have ever, anyone had, had to do a certification at work? Like every five years you have to get recertified? Or every 10 years? Like, what's the limit on this? You know, do I have to feed someone like every 10 years? Maybe 15 years? Come on, Jesus, help me. But how often do I have to do these things? Do I have to do this every year? Every week? Seven times 70? I believe that this is not about a... Jesus doesn't give us a checklist to say, yeah, look, I've done this and, and, and I do it all the time. But Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, you will know a tree by its fruit. And so it's not a matter of have I ever done this in my life? The question is... Am I a person who shows care when people suffer? When I encounter hunger, am I a person who cares and responds? Or do I retreat by being desensitized? Do I shut down because I'm overwhelmed with the hurts of the world? We are called, I believe, in the Gospel of Matthew, to make love the goal 
How many of you feel that you have failed at love in the last six months? One month? 72 hours? Two hours? Right? The reality is, and I always look at 1 Corinthians 13, that beautiful wedding passage, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast, right? Doesn't, doesn't uh, rejoice in wrong. I always see that as, as, a, rest, as a, a checklist of failure, right? Ah, oh, I messed that up. I didn't get there. But what Jesus shows us is love is the goal, right? It's where we are constantly striving. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, says that, that the purpose of religion is salvation. The means of salvation is faith. But how we get there is that love flows in our lives. And so what Jesus is showing us is we're not trying to outdo good our neighbor, but we simply are trying to love as imperfectly as we do, always seeking to rest in God's care. So what does that have to do with the natural world? What I want to say today, friends, is that when we hear news of climate change or of global weirding of weather patterns or of floods uh, in Dubai that are caused by increasing temperatures or when we hear news of water pollution or of air pollution or of environmental degradation, we can close inward. We can say there's nothing that I can do or oh this is a political issue that can only be solved by corporations and governments. We can close in on ourselves and I want to say to the church today it is the same as turning our back on a person who is hungry. When we see the world sick we have a role in it and it is not a political issue it is a spiritual issue. Because God has created the world. And God has not just given it to us for our own benefit, but we are to till and keep the land so that the next generations have the same glory and beauty of the ocean, of the skies, of the mountains and the trees and the water. And when we do nothing, it is like we are ignoring those who hurt. Here's the other thing. You might not buy that I say loving creation is like loving a human. You might not buy into that. But what I will say is when, is when we abandon care for climate, the least of these suffer the most. The least of these suffer the most. They are the ones who are displaced. They are the ones... Think about people who drink poisoned water in Michigan. Think about people who don't ac- have access to clean water in parts of Southeast Asia and Africa and Latin America and even in the United States. So when we turn our backs on the changing factors of our environment, we are in turn turning our back on the least of these. The United Methodist Church is meeting right now officially in something called General Conference. They met last week, they'll meet in the week to come. One thing that they've already done is voted to update our social principles. The United Methodist Church has this document called the Social Principles, which is a lengthy statement on issues of what of where we see that they are spiritual and not political. And they're issues of humanity and how we engage in the world. And in those social principles, um, there's a statement about creation. Again, you can access these with the QR code or a link in the sermon notes. Listen to this. All creation is the Lord's, and we are responsible to the ways in which we use and abuse it. Water, air, soil, minerals, energy resources, plants, animal life, and space are to be valued and conserved because they are God's creation and not solely because they are useful to human beings. God has granted us stewardship of creation. We should meet these stewardship duties through acts of loving care and respect. Economic, political, social, and technological developments have increased our human numbers and lengthened and enriched our lives. However, these developments have led to regional defoliation, dramatic extinction of species, massive human suffering, overpopulation, and misuse of overconsumption of natural and non-renewable resources, particularly by industrialized societies. This continued course of action jeopardizes the natural heritage that God has entrusted to all generations. 
Therefore, let us recognize the responsibility of the church and its members to place a high priority on changes in economic, political, social, and technological lifestyles to support a more ecologically equitable and sustainable world leading to a higher quality of life for all God's creation. What a mouthful. Let me boil it down to you. I am grateful for technology. Amen? I am grateful for the advances in healthcare. It is amazing what we can do. Amen? I am grateful that my parents are living longer than, the, than their parents in many cases. A amen? And I plan to do the same. Amen? But the results of all of the industrialization have come at a cost. And so these, these social principles call on the church and its members to strive for a more just, more sustainable world in which we are advancing with care. That no benefit comes at the cost of the least of these. That the way that we live our lives is a way that loves and cares for all of those in the world. Friends, we are wrapping up this sermon series, but let the work begin. We have a green team in this church. If you're on our green team, can you raise your hand? We have folks who are helping to lead the charge. I know they're doing a book study right now on a book by Catherine Hayhoe called Saving Us, and they're learning about how to have these conversations in faith settings. They're leading us in some efforts. Let the work begin now. And if you want to understand the whole bottom line of this sermon series, it is this. Caring for the environment is not political. It is spiritual. And the way that the world has politicized it has come at a great cost and a great toll. And we as people of faith should stand by no more. And we should care for the world regardless of our perspective. Because our call, whether you're on the right, the left, or in the middle, is to love God and to love our neighbor. Amen. The first words of the Bible are about God's own generosity. God gave us this beautiful creation and everything on it, from the beautiful rivers and streams to the majestic mountains and valleys. But climate change, or global weirding, is destroying our common home. And climate change is not just a science issue. It's an issue of health, a food issue, a water issue, and an economic issue. It's an issue of hunger, of poverty, and of justice. It's a human issue. Let us act as part of humanity by giving to the ministries of this church today. The ushers will come around now to collect your tithes and offerings, or you can give electronically through our app, by text, or online at haddonfieldumc.org slash give.
close today by singing a song. It's called Known by Love. Let's stand together and sing. that make your heart break I don't want to say things you'd never say Come have your way me Sing with us Let justice roll like a river in my soul Let mercy overflow like a flood like you want to be known by love, but there are days and there are moments of every day in which I fall short. But if love is the goal, we know that every day is a new opportunity and every mercy and every joy and every amount of grace is renewed with each morning. As a community of faith, we are not perfect people, but we are following in the footsteps of Jesus, seeking to be perfected in love. And so as we go from this place, let us be quick to forgive, slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to meet care and hurt with love. Let us go from this place and care for those who suffer and even when it is the world around us, our waterways, our air, our mountains, our streams, our trees, let us show God's creation the same love and compassion that God gives us. Let us go and be the church in a hurting world. Amen. In my heart, in my mind, send a revival. 